And, uh, we looked locally to, as I referred to him the other day, uh, the energizer bunny of the <laughs> local live music scene. Um, Richard uh, is one of my mentors and uh, has been an inspiration uh, to many people uh, producing concerts and promoting music and uh, supporting the live scene. He supports artists. Um, he's out uh, at shows, sometimes several per night, over and over. And, um, and there are insights that we want to hear him talk about today. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a Q&A with him after he makes his remarks so that you can have some questions. But um, hopefully we'll get all the way back to the, his arrival in Toronto from the UK and, uh, and people like Louis Armstrong and Muddy Waters and B.B. King and others that he promoted in the 60s. But uh, he's a now guy. So let's please give a warm welcome to Richard Flo Hill. I'm a bit late today because I had to do my laundry. <laughs> Billy Connolly, the Scottish comedian and actor, always used to start his sets by saying, Fuck, how do I start this? Where do you begin? And then he would do two and a half hours. I'm not going to go that far, but I may be long. I'll start in two ways. First of all, a very, very warm welcome to you all, especially those who, as they say in Newfoundland, have come from away. Uh, I hope your time in Toronto has been rewarding. I hope over the last couple of days and again tonight you'll hear some of the very best um, blues that Canada has to offer, and that's particularly to um, the people who have come from abroad. Um, Toronto's a unique place. It's the uh, fourth largest urban community in North America, and it's the cultural center of the entire country. It's also the only thing that all Canadians agree about, whether they come from Vancouver, or the Arctic, or the Maritimes, or the Prairies, or Quebec. There's only one thing they all know for certain. Toronto sucks. <laughs> You, you know that isn't true, and I hope that this has proved. The second way I'd like to start this is to outline the marching orders I was given when I was asked to be your keynote speaker. I'm also amazed, incidentally, that the keynote speaker seems to be towards the end of the event. Seems to me it ought to be at the beginning, but I, what do I know? So, I was instructed to do the following. One, tell stories because I do that. <laughs> Two, outline the state of the, of the blues nation. Emphasize our strengths. Be informative, be controversial, be inspirational, be challenging. Jeez. So can I start with a story? <laughs> Many of you, I hope, in this room are familiar with and have warm memories of the late Long John Baldry. John, who was six foot seven in his stocking feet and wore high heel boots and hats, so you would talk to him like that, um, was having dinner in an Indian restaurant in Soho with his best friend, Rod Stewart. Uh, they got fairly well um, Liquor. Yes. <laughs> um, and they collected their leftover food and put it in little packages and stumbled out into the waiting limousine. The limousine took off very slowly and was T-boned by a truck at the next intersection. <laughs> Bang, smash, crash, broken glass. And if you've ever been in a car wreck, you know there's a second of silence when all the glass stops tinkling and are my legs still, you know. Stuart is lying on the floor of the limousine. John, he says, John, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding. I'm, I'm dying. I'm bleeding. There's blood everywhere. And John looked down and says, no, Roddy, that's not blood. That's my chicken bindaloo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. Um, the state of the blues nation, mixed. Um, on one hand, there are more blues players, more blues bands than ever before. Uh, last summer, I was staying at my friend Holger Peterson's house, and he let me rifle through several years' worth of CDs that, for one reason or another, were um, surplus to requirements for either his radio show um, or, 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 or his two radio shows. And I found some really amazing records. There is apparently a blues band in every single town in North America. And the bigger towns have three, four, five, six. So, uh, the, the success, when we look at the upside of the blues world, the success of the International Blues Challenge in Memphis, which literally sees bands from India as well as Indiana, from Boston to Brazil, from Toronto to Tucson, and it's an affirmation that this century-old musical tradition remains in strong hands. As usual, Canadians waving our little maple leaf flags are delighted to see so many of our artists taking part and doing so well. Yay. This music, which unites us all, is of course no longer the original preserve of Afro-Americans from the southern United States. No better illustration of this was the uh, fact that a few years ago I was asked to um, give a keynote speech at the Blues Challenge, and here I was, a British-born Canadian whose parents were German, Jewish, and Dutch, respectively, <laughs> and in Memphis, no less. <laughs> um, another indication that the blues are alive and well is the strength and the number of dozens of blues societies. Uh, from Finland to the Fraser Valley, from Croatia to California, Dublin to Delaware, Ottawa to Oregon, and Montreal to Memphis. Almost 300 organizations around the world keeping the blues alive. A word too about the Blues Foundation, which is based in Memphis, and its role in keeping the spotlight on our music. The IBC is a major event to launch a career. Eight years ago, my friend Shakura Saida came in second and launched a career that has taken her since to numerous tours in Europe, across the United States and Canada, regular trips to Panama. She's been to Albania. I don't even know for sure where Albania actually is. <laughs> She's also had one-offs in Moscow, Rwanda, and Australia, and her career still goes on. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's good, really good at the IBC to see Canadian artists pulling way above their weight. Uh, the annual... Um, Blues Awards. I wish they hadn't taken W.C. Handy's name off them. Because now it's right. the Blues Amen. Awards. It should be somebody's Blues Awards. And W.C. Handy, yeah, okay. Um, I think Barbara Newman is coming in tomorrow for the Blues Awards and you just beat her up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Closer to home, the TPS, Toronto Blues Society, which has taken the initiative to if create this event. We, we do the annual Blues Awards at, at Kerner Hall uh, on Monday night and it's going to be spectacular. I understand Steve Mariner is not going to imitate me this year. <laughs> this is a great relief, I must say. It was appalling me. The Women's Blues Review, which we put on every year was in Roy Thompson Hall this year for the first time while Massey Hall gets a long overdue renovation. It was the most successful one we've ever done on every level and it was further proof of the depth of the uh, talent pool of Canadian women artists. Um, <laughs> Okay, story number two. <clears throat> Jeff Healy, who we all know, has been gone from us for 10 years. 
He was the most obsessive record collector ever. Worse than Holder. <laughs> Worse than Larry LeBlanc, who has every record he ever, he was the former editor of the Canadian editor of Billboard, he has every record he ever received from a record company in his entire life. His whole house could descend with a big sucking noise to Australia. <laughs> the weight of stuff. Um, Jeff Healy lived at that time in Etobicoke and he had a ranch style bungalow, a long low building with a long basement. Three of the walls in the basement were racked four deep with, uh, with uh, vinyl records. He had 25,000 of them. <laughs> they weren't in sleeves with little braille, no, they were just decked up against each other and in terrible shape. Awful shape. So I was sitting in his basement and I said, Ah, oh, Jeff, do you, do you, do you by any chance have anything by a band called Harry Roy? He was an, a, a long ago hotel band leader in Britain. Oh, he says, Harry Roy, yes. And he goes to the shelf, <laughs> pulls one out, said, There you go. Harry Roy, Piccadilly Ride. <laughs> Parlophone 3942. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked his dad, but I said, how the hell does Jeff do that? He said, you got to understand. He doesn't have a brain in there. It's a computer. <laughs> uh, we're fortunate, and there's been reference to this, and I know that there are, there are workshops covering this, but... We're very fortunate, compared to our neighbors in the United States, to have art supports worth millions of dollars, some of which trickles down to us in the police world. <laughs> this state of affairs, uh, for a quick history lesson from our friends from the United States and abroad, um, happened because Canada lies next to the most culturally diverse and uh, exhaustive source of talent and, and culture. Not only music, but film, television, magazines, books, you name it. A tsunami of stuff washing over the border to drown whatever we have as Canadians that may be unique. So in 1970, and gosh, that's half a century ago, um, the government passed the Canadian content regulations, much to the annoyance of broadcasters who liked the way it was. That they could just get a consultant in Dallas to tell them what to play. Suddenly they had to use their own brains and listen to Canadian music, most of which was terrible because we had no infrastructure. We had no studios. Well, I think there were two studios in Toronto in 1970, maybe three. Um, no agents, no managers, no publicists, no nothing. Well, a little bit. But. So that triggered off a change, and it's a change we've all benefited from. Today, on national, provincial, and municipal levels, there's a staggering level of financial support for music organizations, record companies and individual artists. The City of Toronto budget to support music and arts in this city is ten million dollars. Does all this work? Oh, I think I jumped a page. That's bad. Yeah, no I didn't. <laughs> yes, it works. That's the, is the Pope Catholic? Do bears poop in the woods? Yes, they do. And in 1970, as an illustration of this, the two performing rights organizations that existed then took in only $90,000 for the use of Canadian music around the world. Last year, it was $76 million. The Canada Council delivers $215 million in grants each year. Three quarters to arts organizations, the rest to some 350 groups, and 2,300 individual artists. 
The American equivalent, the National Endowment for the Arts, has a budget of only 150 million. In a country uh, that has 10 times the population of ours. Individual foundations in the States help make some of the shortage, and, uh, up some of the shortage, and in Canada, the SoCan Foundation supports artists, as do a number of private organizations, and most notably the Slate Family Foundation. Another m m source of major support, and incidentally, endless grumbling, because a lot, most people don't get the grants that they applied for, <laughs> is Factor which is funded by private radio stations across the country. There's a caveat. The United States is saddled with an illiterate, bumbling fool of a president <laughs> who governs by Twitter and has a deadlocked government. I suspect there's not one single person in the White House who give a shit about arts communities. And if Trump were less of a blundering idiot, put all those pansy artists out of business and close all those left-wing organizations. <laughs> and let's not get smug. No. <laughs> we have Trump Jr. here in Ontario. <laughs> a a one-time drug dealer who made a buck of beer a central part of his platform, running our provincial government, Doug Ford's going amok with an ax, and at the same time, he just offered a 98-year-old former mayor of one of our dismal suburbs a fee of $150,000 for advice. Now, you can't make that shit up. Can you? <laughs> Fortunately, she turned it down and said she was too busy. Uh, I will say one thing, if I was working for the Ontario Arts Council, I'd be kind of checking out whether there any other job in it. <laughs> Story three. The best blues band in Canada, I think, was the early days of the Downchild Blues Band. <laughs> the band was led by Donnie Walsh and his brother Richard, known as Hawk as in Hancock, Walsh. And as we all know, they were the source of the inspiration for the existence of the Blues Brothers. As good a singer as Hawk was, and I think he was the very best, he was somewhat careless with his hygiene. <laughs> After 10 showerless days in the van, uh, there was mutiny. <laughs> and legend has it that in Regina, they forced an intervention on him. <laughs> and he was instructed, even threatened. You've got to have a shower every night, Hawk. Every night. You've got to change your socks. <laughs> and this went on for an hour. And chastened, he left the room. And somebody said, ah, one more thing. When the van goes at 11, it goes at 11. It doesn't go at quarter past. It doesn't go to quarter to 12. It goes at 11. Next morning, the van, on, the band on its way to Saskatoon was sitting in the van. The shotgun seat was open for Hawk's considerable girth. And suddenly, there was a hubbub. Here comes Hawk, suitcase, army boots, but otherwise stark naked, <laughs> dripping wet, <laughs> through the hotel corridors where the maids were making up the room, across the lobby. Across the parking lot, in the band, the band is like, <laughs> and Hawk says, eleven o'clock. Talk a bit about community because that's we are all for sure part of a specific blues community that operates on notion, local, national, and international levels. Oh, sound guy. Hi, you're doing <laughs> <laughs> um, A few years ago, when I spoke to a, a gathering in the folk community in upstate New York, I called the folk community a gang. Well, we're a gang, too. 
we are members of the blues gang. And there's good stuff about that, and there's less good stuff. The good stuff is that we support each other, we applaud each other. As a rule, we do what we can to help each other. We often ride together, we share information and ideas. Hey, we're in a gang, that's cool. That's the good stuff. The less good stuff is that we are resistant to change. We tend to listen to the good old music and distrust any musician, distrust at least for a while, any musician who steps outside the tried and true, any musician who normally works in another genre and records or performs blues. Hi, Miles Goodwin. <laughs> there are times when factions of our gang scrap with each other. The purists who think Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eric Clapton and the Rolling Stones are just rock and roll fans. In fact, they have a lot to do with the blues because they have brought thousands of people inside the tent that we are all in. So it's time to open our collective ears. Yes, know your history. And if you don't know your blues history, for crying out loud, learn it now, quick. And then leave it behind. <laughs> Using the basic lessons creates something new. Salute Paul Reddick for tampering with the lyrical content of music that stems from it. I thank him too for the Cobalt Prize, which honors songwriters who push the envelope. Congratulate Sue Foley for including what? A flamenco dance at the Women's Blues Review a couple of years ago. Applaud the people who mix the blues with other genres and folk artists to include and folk artists and pop artists who include blues material in what they do. Christine Aguilera, do you remember Bruce uh, Iglar a few years ago played this amazing record and they said, who's that? And nobody knew. Um, Cindy Lauper's also made a blues record, B.B. King's on it, for what it's worth. It's not great, but it's worth listening. <laughs> my, my dear friend Roxanne Popvan, who followed her heart, sort of moved away from blues into a pop world. Every now and then, she'll play a blues, a Freddie King tune in the middle of a set, and the whole audience goes, wow, how, did, how does she know how to do that? So, widen your musical taste, take the wax out of your ears, go hear a rap artist. Uh, in Toronto, the first Monday of every night, go to the Monarch Tavern, where there's a 14-piece band playing the original Count Basie, Fletcher Henderson, and Duke Ellington charts. It's amazing. These are musicians who, if their charts were in Arabic and upside down, could play them. And they swing like mad. Uh, Go to Grossman's on a Saturday afternoon and hear the happy yeah. house. It's a great band. It's been there every Saturday for 47 years. That's not the same players. Dying. Um, listen to the way that the pop rock band Whitehorse re-envisages the blues. They have two EPs in which they have totally revisioned um, the chess catalog that we're all familiar with. Uh, here, oh, here's another one. Here, Alison Young, sit in with your band. She's done it twice last night with Raul Banesha and with um, Jenny Tai. Yes. Absolutely amazing. I'm Old crazy. school tennis sack. Go to the symphony. It, it, it's, it's amazing. It's time also that blues musicians have to understand that they're entertainers. If they want to prosper, they can't be as sloppy as they imagine the pioneers were. <laughs> Robert Johnson knew he was an entertainer. Certainly B.B. King did. And so does Buddy Guy this day. They're entertainers. Try and be that. No more hitting the stage with the knees, hanging out of the jeans. Come on. I, I, I want to have a GoFundMe campaign 
to buy jeans for. Uh, I know. I think. I think. I think there should be a rule. Only one person in the band should wear a hat. <laughs> Uh, do original material if you can, and if you do covers, please choose original ones. Everyone, promise, promise, you're not going to play Mustang Sally again. <laughs> I don't know how I'm doing for time, I'm just going to keep going until somebody starts throwing something, I suppose. Um, I, I'd like to story number three. Solomon Burke, the world's largest blues singer, both in voice, in personality, and in girth. Solomon had um, a 12, 13-piece band, uh, three backup singers, four horn players, a concert harpist, um, piano, organ, drums, guitar, bass, sometimes two drummers. And they would play a song called Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, which was Solomon's signature tune and which he wrote. Solomon, the band would play the riff, and suddenly they would say, the stage is set up, there is a throne in the center of the stage, there are silver vases with red roses in, it's a red carpet. Ladies and gentlemen, the king of rock and soul, and Solomon would come out wearing a floor-length red velvet cape with white fur trim, and inside, sewn in little plastic containers, 400 silver dollars. Can you imagine how much that weighs? Everybody in the band is wearing black. One guy is in pink. And his job is to walk behind Solomon, take the cape, and spin it off stage. I saw him do the whole show, and incidentally at a daytime workshop, marry a couple on stage, because Solomon was a minister as well. Um, <laughs> He was also an undertaker. Um, um, and I said, Solomon, the thing with the cape was just great. He said, yes, but in the day, back in the day, in the old days, we had a dwarf in the band called Little Sammy. And Sammy would walk behind me under the cape. I would drop the cape, I would walk to the throne, the cape would just... <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that kind of thing anymore. And I, 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 I do, in the era of political correctness, I suggest you don't. <laughs> we have a lot of challenges in this blues business of ours. And how well this gang uh, works will survive, will help it survive. First of all, we're going to have to do a much better job of promoting ourselves and our music than we have been doing. We've long been marginalized by radio and ignored by television. The chances that the blues will even be noticed by mainstream print media are minimal. No record reviews in the Globe and Mail. No concert reviews in the Star. Profile of a blues musician, don't hold your breath. There's lots of stuff about movies in mainstream press because movies advertise. But the fact is, more people go to hear live music than go to the movies. There are still blues magazines, they haven't died yet. Support them, buy a subscription. The bulk of our coverage is online. It's patchy, it's inconsistent, and it's hard to find. Tons of stuff on social media, but the fact is the blue story is staying in the bubble where we all live. And what we need to do is widen our audience. Financially, there's a challenge. We have to replace the income we are losing as the CD vanishes. In five years, it'll be as extinct as Jeff Healy's record collection. Mm. And I say this with regret, because I have 6,500 pieces of outdated technology in my apartment. <laughs> right now, 86% of all recorded music revenues come from digital music. 
not CDs, not the purported increase in vinyl sales. Please don't wait, incidentally, for a revival of the 8-track. It's not <laughs> You can spend a lot of time whining about how little your check from streaming services actually is. But I would say that we don't often realize that the tiny fraction of a cent per play is a reward for one play, sung a play one song, into one listener's ear and don't look for an income for people downloading music they're not doing that anymore streaming is the thing story five no yes four five whatever <laughs> uh, I won't burden you with any more quotes rules but I'll mention three that the great songwriter Randy Newman told me one always introduce yourself on stage even if somebody else has just done it Secondly, never tell the audience if you're sick. Thirdly, never leave your wallet in the dressing room. <laughs> Incidentally, on that one, I, I have you all seen the amazing video of Aretha Franklin uh, at a tribute at the Kennedy Center to Carol King. Yes. She comes out with a long fur coat carrying a purse. Yes. Yeah. She puts the purse on the piano and that's where the money is. <laughs> so I'm not leaving that in the So, some, some quick rules from an outsider, from a guy who can't sing, can't play an instrument, dance like a pregnant <coughs> elephant. First, become better. Become a better artist. Write better songs. Have a professional attitude and professional presentation. That, thank goodness, goes without saying for most of us, of the artists here. And the business people who work with them are constantly trying to improve. It's too late to stop now. Everybody can be better. Rule two, get better, much better at promoting yourself. That means building a better website. Being continually present on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the time. Having better photographs. More videos, profession, prof, preferably professionally shot live video, then we all know what you look like and sound like. Um, it's a great idea to have create an EPK, a three to four to five minute little documentary on who you are, where you came from, what your music sounds like, and that has to engage three sets of people, uh, media, your fans, and most of all, the people who might hire you. Become an expert at the business of music. Join the union. Ooh. They said I had to be controversial. Um, I know how to write grants. Be active as members of SOCAN, CMRRA, AFM, and all the other organizations with acronyms that you can't quite remember what they stand for. Rule four. Become a specialist in another area, finding the right people to help you. Finding a manager, finding an agent is always hard for people who play what we might call minority music. Agents and, and um, who work and managers work on a percentage of your income and a percentage of not very much is even less. So what you are involved in doing is searching for a believer. And that sounds evangelical, and it sort of is, because what you're looking for is somebody who says, I know I'm not going to make any money here, but I'm going to invest my time and effort and money because I know that this talent is there. And that's who you're searching for. Find a publicist. It's not that I need any more work. Honestly, I don't. And no, I don't think Sarah French has any ability to get any more work. She's already the best at this game that there is. And I'm proud to say that I'm one of the people who mentored her early in the age. And I'm really proud that she was given an award at the uh, Blues Foundation. <laughs> Thank you.
the, the reality about publicity work is that it's not rocket science. Uh, it's who you know, and uh, you can do it yourself if you have the time. One more rule that hasn't changed. Know your fans. Who are they? Keep them in the loop. Keep them engaged. Talk to them. That's what social media is for. And one last thing, be nice. <laughs> the biggest challenge of all, though, that faces every musician in every genre, how do we grow our audiences? <coughs> how do we get the people who pay to come and see you to come and see you? Uh, there's other things to do. Too many of them are staying home to watch Netflix. Too many people are checking their telephones. Incidentally, I don't know whether I got it. Um, too many of them are saying it's raining, it's cold, it's freezing, it's too hot. I don't want to. I I I, I don't want to go indoors to hear music. So collectively, we have to get these people off their asses and out of their apartments and houses. We have to do it now while there are still venues. Okay, here's another bit of news. Not enough venues. Blame the condo boom. Blame gentrification. Blame neighbors who don't want noise at night. Blame club owners who would prefer, as they have in the past, to have disco, karaoke, strippers, whatever. <laughs> the best clubs here in Toronto and for the outsiders, forgive me, but I know that you could give a list in your, in your cities. The Rex, the Senator, the Dakota, the Horseshoe, Lee's Palace, Castro's, the Painted Lady, the Linsmore, the Cameron, the Monarch, the Cadillac Lounge, the Lula Lounge, Hughes Room Live. We may not like a lot of the music that they play, but they've all been hospitable to the blues, and we'll see what happens if and when the Matador and the Elma Combo finally come on stream. <laughs> Encourage them, patronize them, play your best shows there, and buy another beer. Another story. Van Morrison, a blues artist if ever there was one, and arguably the grumpiest man in entertainment history. He called a friend of mine called Ed Bicknell, and Ed Bicknell uh, used to manage Dire Straits. <coughs> And he gets a phone call, it's Van Morrison here, I'm needing a new manager. And Ed went, oh. <laughs> he knew that Van had had 38 managers in a 40 year career. <laughs> and, but it's Van Morrison, so they had a meeting. At the end of the meeting, Ed said, Van, look, let me think about this and I'll give you a call tomorrow morning. How do, uh, how do I reach you? And Van laboriously wrote out two telephone numbers on a slip of paper and handed it over. And Ed said, uh, what's the difference between these two numbers? And Van said, nothing. I don't answer either of them. <laughs> There's a blazing bright light in all this, and this is blues festivals. The best ones are prospering. I used to get pissed at the Ottawa Blues Festival because they had, headliners had nothing whatever to do with blues. But as I've grown a bit, I kind of think, yeah, but they brought people in and the word blues became synony synonymous with music. Uh, and maybe the headliners and the audience for that matter heard the real thing along the way. More and more folk festivals should use blues artists. And if this music isn't folk, I don't know what is. I love the idea of a Joni Mitchell fan discovering a high-powered sort of show that Miss Emily and Jenny Ty put on in the last couple of nights. <laughs> so here we are. The blues is alive. Or should be. The blues are alive. I don't know. Grammar. There are problems, difficulties, and challenges, and sometimes they seem insurmountable. When that happens, we only have one solution. We have to become better at what we do, and we have to look to ourselves for the strength to fight the battle. I'd like to come towards the close of this by quoting a folky friend of mine, a guy from originally from Halifax, called Steve Poltz, and he wrote this on Facebook yesterday. I'm touched on the idea that you have to be driven, obsessed, 
a lifer. Now, of course, you don't have to be all of that, but it helps. And it hurts. This business is 24-7 for me. I know I'm out of balance. I constantly have people who say to me, you need to slow down. Is this a hard life? You're never home. Didn't you once have a stroke on stage and go blind? <laughs> well, yes, I did. I had a stroke on stage, and I did go blind for a bit. I know I should slow down. Maybe I'll end up dying on stage with my boots on. That's fine. But here's the thing. It's not a hard life for me. A hard life for me would be being mired in some job I hated. And ain't that the truth? As Donnie Walsh once said, you might not get rich doing this, but if you do it right, you'll more than get by. Better still, this road we're all on is being lit up with new young performers. <coughs> I've been a joy to hang with Earl and Coffin and with uh, Spencer McKenzie and some of the other young contemporaries who are here. As they gather wisdom, support and encouragement from older folk, they give new energy, new innocence, new joy to the music we all love. Overall, Despite the problems and difficulties which only hard effort and inspired playing and dedication will work to solve, the Blues Nation is in pretty good shape. All of us who are members of this awesome gang were carrying a torch. The blazing music that for a century has changed, enriched, encouraged, inspires countless millions around the world. We're privileged as players, writers, backstage workers, fans and supporters to keep this powerful, resonant music happening. And we will succeed. As Billy Connolly said, fuck, I've been here for 25 minutes. I want to go home. Thank you very much. <laughs> Richard said, do I have to do more than 20 minutes? I think you exceeded 20 minutes, actually, yes. So we probably only have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A and other uh, stories that weren't told. You pulled a few out. So how's the book coming? <laughs> And the line is, if it's not on, it's not on. That's <laughs> <laughs> a really good line. Um, oh, the book. Well, I started about eight years ago. I thought it'd be nice to put some of these stories, and, and many others, into a book. And I, I'd met Louis Armstrong when I was a kid. And I didn't know that he was a great proponent of a, a herbal laxative called Swiss Chris. And when I told him what a wonderful show I'd seen and blah, 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 he said, so, are you regular? <laughs> I said, pardon? <laughs> said, are you regular? Do you have gas? And I, I just lost it. And he, he lost patience and he had a flyer with a keyhole shaped picture of himself on the john with his pants around his ankles and a big grin and said, Satchmo says, leave it all behind you. <laughs> I, I thought that Louis Armstrong's laxative would be a good kind, but I eventually changed it and it's now called The Night Miles Davis Tried to Buy My Car and 100 other mostly true stories of life at the edge of music. Um, now, it's nearly done. Well, yes it is. Um, my friend Michael Rycraft is designing it, and it won't look like a book, it'll look more like a magazine, because too many pictures and that. Uh, I've got 55,000 words I have to edit and put in order, and I have two chapters, not chapters, pieces to write 
one, neither of our blues people, but people who I've had the privilege of working with, um, Katie Lang and Lorena McKenna. Once that's done, I need to do one final chapter to wrap it up. Then I'm having the whole damn thing printed in Taiwan with child labor. Um, because at least it'll be cheap enough for you to afford to buy a copy. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long answer, wasn't it? That's quite all right. The, uh, if you ever are looking for uh, another career, Richard, perhaps stand-up comedy is uh, waiting for you. You've got more... Oh, I would hate that. Did you see these stand-up comics on television, on, on Netflix? They're awful. And, yeah, occasionally you can say, fuck, you get away with it, but, oh, those people are mostly awful. Sorry. George Carlin. Yeah. And Billy Connolly, of course. Yeah. You've dropped a couple. Well, I was thinking Connolly's kind of retiring and not not at 100%. Yes. You may need to fill his shoes. Um, the uh, you just dropped a couple names that I wanted to get to. Louis Armstrong was and and the, the ladies that you've worked with, uh, Serena Ryder, Katie Lang, Alejandro Rivera, uh, Lorena McKinnon. The, the is there any of those uh, artists that I mean, are you still working with Lorena? No, not really, but I, I retired. When I turned 80, I retired. And then three months later, I said, bugger this for it, and I went back to work again. But meanwhile, I had resigned um, my two best-paying accounts, my friends at Stony Plain and, uh, and um, Lorena, who is the most difficult artist in some ways that I've ever worked with, and also the most generous and kindest. I've traveled with her at her expense in Spain, in Italy, uh, into New Orleans, to Telluride, to across Canada. Um, she travels with the masseuse and the chef, right? Uh, yes. Well, on the European tour, we had a road crew of 15 people, uh, two uh, c caterers and cooks, um, a massage therapist, a woman called Christine Sutherland, who runs um, major, yeah, so she comes to the ride because, you know, the road guys carry stuff around and they need, you know, a massage, damn right. Um, there was one lovely incident, we were playing in Milan and Lorena's machine works like clockwork. And like the story I told, we're at 11 o'clock, we're in the big tour bus, Lorena comes on and says, well, ladies and gents, tonight maybe no show. Huh? It had turned out that uh, her contract rider, which was that thick, and listed everything, including the dimensions of the vehicles and so on, that the promoter in Venice, or actually outside Venice in Mestre, which is the town at the other end of the causeway into Venice, had not checked. And it meant that the crew had to carry all the equipment, the sound, the board, the set, because she carried a set uh, for the stage, uh, 50 yards up a cobblestone street. And Lorena said, no. My guys work hard enough without having to do that. You hire a bunch of loaders to do the job, carry it up there, and uh, we'll do the show, otherwise we won't. And they did. And the PS to that is that that night, my wife and I were standing our job, we gave ourselves a job because, you know, shit, we're, we're going for free here. Mm -hmm. And we gave, our job was to give out people programs when they came in. Now in Italy, nobody does this. You don't have programs at yeah. Italian shows. So everybody would say, quanta costa, how much? Mm -hmm. Or, no. I, but that was our job. And afterwards we went in to the hall briefly because we'd seen the show at, at two or three other places before. <coughs> And notice that the, uh, it was packed, it was jammed. They were sitting in the aisles, they were standing at the back, short of hanging on the chandelier. Didn't mind, went downstairs, had a drink, chatted to the tour manager. I said, have you seen upstairs, man? It's jammed, it's packed, they're standing. He said, what? So my wife, myself, and the tour manager, we went up, and in the dark, during the show, counted how many people were sitting or standing. It was about... I think I had 297, my wife had 301, whatever, didn't matter. The promoter had sold all this standing room 
for extra money to pay for the cost of the loaders. <laughs> and he sure as hell wasn't going, well, needless to say, Lorena had words. And I'm quite sure she got the money. Sorry, was, I sidetracked that. I'm telling you, there is, there is a future for your storytelling, Richard, and uh, I think we're all going to buy the book. Uh, landing here from the UK, uh, I know you've told some of us over the years the, what it was like. Can you just flash back to the, the tr city of Toronto uh, snapshot and version that you saw? Because I know it impressed you enough to stay, and, and you saw things that uh, were advertised, various shows yeah. on offer, and, and it kind of inspired you to get into uh, what it is that we all do here. Well, when I came, um in April 1957, Toronto was the most uptight, Presbyterian, closed on Sunday place in the world, with the exception of a sort of a underbelly that kind of you didn't even know about, um, mostly on the other side of Java Street. But on my first day in Canada, I walked down Young Street there was a sign outside the bar that said, Tonight, all this week, Earl Hines and his All Stars. Earl Hines? I mean, I'm a jazz fan. Go upstairs, I said, Earl Hines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the guy that played with Louis Armstrong in the 20s and had a big band in the 40s, yeah, yeah. Well, how much is it to get in? He said, It's free, but you've got to buy two drinks. <laughs> so I thought this could be the promised land. <laughs> And the, uh, the next day I found a Dixieland Jazz Club, rather like the ones I used to go to in England. And the day after that I wandered further down Young Street and it turned into a bar called the Town Tavern. And uh, the Stanley Cup hockey finals were on, there was a TV over the stage with the hockey game on, but no sound, thank God. And on stage is this rotund pianist from Montreal called Oscar Peterson, <laughs> who I'd never heard of. And the night after that, for $2.50, I went to Maple Leaf Gardens to hear the Parade of Stars featuring 16-year-old boy wonder from Ottawa, Canada, Paul Anker, <laughs> with Clyde McFadden, John Lee Hooker, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Laverne Baker. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I stayed. <laughs> We've only got about five minutes left, to, and we have to clear this room and set up for another, uh, for another show. Well, uh, it's called speed dating. Oh, yes. yes. And the tables and chairs and everything else has to be. Uh, uh, we're, I'm going to do short answers, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> You've broken promises with me before, I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you, you, you gave some props up to, to you and to Sarah and some others. It's, uh, it's great to have uh, your voice acknowledge them. Um, as a promoter, uh, Richard and I have, have shared a lot of uh, turf, so to speak, uh, as promoters in Toronto, and, and things have changed uh, for all of us. And we were talking about those things here, uh, digital change in particular, and you touched on it. Um, as a promoter yourself, um, I'm just wondering if you could uh, drop an insight or observation. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't want to use the word gimmick because that would be beneath you, but, but as a promoter you always have to look for creative solutions to uh, getting that audience out. You've talked a lot about developing audience and you know, is, is there anything that you could offer to our captive audience about how you approach uh, promotion? Like when you see an act, how do you, what, how do you then craft a release? Uh, Get, develop the, uh, the story idea for the person who's going to make that decision about whether there's ink spilled at the Globe or whatever? Well, I think every pro everybody who promotes a show is taking a gamble. And there are four elements that you have to think about in advance. And any one of the four elements goes wrong, you're in trouble. And the four things are the artist. Is the artist a draw? Secondly, in no particular order. Secondly, where's the venue? What is the venue? Is it, does it fit the artist? Or sometimes, is it the opposite of the artist? For example, K.D. Lang's first gig... Albert's Hall. ...was at Albert's Hall in a blues bar. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, thanks people, to Derek. People were standing on the table, so yeah. it kind of worked. <laughs> um, uh, so we've got, uh, and the date. You know, don't do a Jewish artist on Passover. <laughs> I did once. It was awful. Um, so you're looking at ticket price, too much, too little. So any of those four elements can go wrong. And I, I'll forecast, I'll look at a list of concerts and say, that one won't work. This one will, because of those elements. It's a gamble, and what you do is you run your mouth off, you talk to media people, you arrange interviews if you can. Uh, it, it's conventional, but it's hard work. And the difference now is that you also have social media, which, although there's a danger of speaking to yourself in an echo chamber, um, does in fact reach people. And if you've guessed right about the venue, the artist, the ticket price, and the date, you'll be all right. If you've guessed wrong, I've guessed wrong more times than I guess right, I think. You've, uh, you'll be out of pocket, I guess. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, one last moment then, perhaps, because you're, that comment reminded me of, of the Bobby Bland, Bonnie Johnson, Buddy Guy <laughs> night. Maybe I was going to ask, is there anybody way back that, um, that, that you want to just refer to? But I'm going to ask you to go to that night um, as, as the last wee oh. story. This is a horror story. I, I'd done a date with B.B. King in Massey Hall. I had no money. The management of Massey Hall was a bit loosey-goosey and Joe Carton, bless his memory, said, deposit? Nah, don't worry. And B.B. King, the ticket prices were 350, $4.50, 350 and 250 You're not mixing B.B. with and Bobby Bland, are you? No, I'm not. So I thought, oh, I, and I actually made $700. Oh, hello, 1968, that's a lot of money. So I decided to do Bobby Bland, who I had admired for a long time, and was the same booking agent that I'd booked B.B. King from, who thought my accent was quaint, and she liked me. So I got Bobby. And I was going to, it was called Blue Monday. Oh, another lesson, never do a show on a Monday. Don't care what it is, don't do it. So I got, um, the lineup was going to be Whiskey Howl, which was a Toronto wow. band, because the union said, you've got to have a Toronto band. And uh, then it was going to be Buddy Guy, and then it was going to be Magic Sam Magic, and then it was going to be Bobby Bland. Sam Magic died. Oh God, oh, I'd better get somebody else. <laughs> uh, and I did get someone else, I can't remember, that cacked out. Oh, Otis Spam, oh, went to hospital, oh, never came out. Oh. <laughs> so then I booked Sun House. The sun fell in a snowdrift and got frostbite <laughs> the day before. So I had to go on stage and say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Sun House is not here. But we'd arranged to have Lonnie Johnson um, uh, come up from the audience, and he came on stage. He had been in an automobile accident. <laughs> he had been pinned up against the restaurant wall by a car that ran off the road. For those who don't know, Lonnie lived here for five years. Yes, and, and was a major influence on B.B. King and so on and so forth. But uh, we brought Lonnie up. He sang two songs. But he, did he play guitar? No, he couldn't play. Buddy Guy came on stage and played every Lonnie Johnson lick there ever was <laughs> perfectly. And Jim McHogg played bass. I can't remember whether it was a drummer. And when all Bobby's musicians filtered on the stage and outside the spotlight to watch this, and Lonnie sang two songs and stood up and limped into the wings with tears pouring down his face. A huge standing ovation. And I think, well I know, that was almost the last gig he ever did before he passed. So I feel very um, privileged yeah. to have had that happen. And, and, and briefly, one other very quick, quick story. B.B. Uh, yeah. King came in town and said, do you know where Lonnie Johnson is? <coughs> and I said, no, but I'll check. 
He came in town a day early, staying at the Lord Simcoe Hotel. I bet you don't, nobody remembers that one. It was in King and University. And, and uh, I called Howard Matthews. And I said, Howard. Hayes, husband, proprietor of the Underground yes, Railroad. Yes, Underground Railroad, and the husband of Salome Bay, the sort of pioneer Canadian blues singer. And I said, do you know where Lonnie Johnson is? He says, yes. I said, well, where is he? He says, he's in my kitchen. <laughs> I said, oh, can I bring B.B. King around to meet him? He's never met him, and, and uh, so I did, and I picked up B, and we drove to Howard's little house, which is right behind the Phoenix, or in those days, the Diamond Club. And uh, I walked B into the kitchen, and there was Lonnie Johnson, and Sonny Terry, and Brownie McKee. <laughs> and I went, ah. Oh. And people said, oh, well, what did they talk about? I, I felt I had no place in that room. I left them to it. Yeah. Oh. And I think people need to refresh and get ready. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping things, but it's been a privilege to have your spirit. <laughs>